James uses two words, two different words for patience in this passage. If you, if you notice when you read it, how often he says the word patience. But that's because one of these words is, is about patience under circumstances, when it's hard to wait because we're going through tough times. It's the same word James actually used in chapter one. He talks about trials and temptations. But then this other word that he introduces here is being patient with people. It means long patience rather than having a short fuse with people. And as we get near to the end of this series of studies, we're going to see how helpful it is, in, whether it's you've got to wait in, over tough circumstances or when people test your patience. It's very practical, this. The Oxford Dictionary definition says, impatience is when you are annoyed by something or somebody, especially because you have to wait for a long time. And when I read that, I thought, exactly. I wouldn't be impatient if I didn't have to wait so long. I was driving Zoe to work the other day and telling her I had to preach on this passage and it was all about patience. And she said, but you're the most impatient person I know. So I said, well, that's just because you don't know many people. And then she said, no, I know loads of people and you're still the most impatient person. Well, thankfully, the light turned to green at that point, so I changed the subject. I talked to Hannah, my daughter, about it. And then she said, are you going to give some examples about how impatient you are? And I said, well, like what? And she said, well, well, like you hate queues and you hate traffic or you hate anybody going slower than you think that they should, whether they're walking or driving or replying or, or anything when you have to wait. So, yes, I am preaching to myself and I can't wait until this sermon is over. So I'm going to admit it. I, I'm scoring very high on impatience. How about you? Scale of one to ten on the patience test. How do you do? Ten being... Well, me. Pick a number. Come on, hurry up. <laughs> However you scored yourself on that, James can help us. God can help us. Look at the passage again. Have it open in front of you. I want to pull out from it two things that he says will not help and then three things that will if we want to learn patience while you wait. So, two things not to do. You ready? If we want to learn to be patient, two things that we might do. Not... Not me, of course. If you're in that line in the supermarket and you suddenly discover it's the wrong line or you're behind that learner driver, what doesn't help? Two things he mentions is grumbling and swearing. Here in verse 9 he says, don't grumble against one another. Um, the words for other translations say groan, don't groan. And it's like, ugh. And it, actually, this is an internal word rather than a vocalised word. It's like that kind of... Oh, I've got to listen to that horrible music because you just put me on hold. And I, and I might be smiling on the inside, but inside I'm like mumbling. And, and the number two is when it comes out, what's really in, and James says, don't swear, as if we ever blink in wood. Well, where does James pick these words from at the end of the reading about swearing? Where did he hear about swearing? Could it be from the carpenter's shop growing up? See, classically, if we think about swearing, a picture that comes to mind for me is somebody hitting their thumb with a hammer, and then it's like they're like, ah, oh, sassen, frassen, rinken, fassen. Oh. But James's older brother, the carpenter of Nazareth, said as part of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, I say to you, do not swear at all, but let your yes be yes and your no be be no, for whatever is more than these comes from the evil one. So right here, James is repeating what his older brother Jesus said about swearing when they're growing up. And now I'm from a background that involved a lot of swearing. Growing up, I heard it all and repeated most of it back. In the police then, everybody swore. Actually, apart from one guy who everybody called Flipping Jimmy. The reason they called him that is because in all of his service, he'd only ever been heard to say the word flipping once. That was as far as he got in terms of swearing. And then when I became a follower of Jesus and wanted to tell people about that, I realised this was actually a big problem for me. Because I was telling people I followed Jesus, but it didn't sound like it. And flipping Jimmy wasn't a Christian and everybody knew he didn't swear, but I said I was. So I decided I, I would try my best and I'd be like, all right, I'm not going to swear. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. But then halfway through a shift, something would happen and I'd find myself opening my mouth and out it comes as quickly as you could say, Sharapova. I just couldn't 
change myself. And then one day, I, I just prayed all the way into work. I'll never forget, I just, I just said, Lord, I need you to change this. I need you to change me, the inside of me. I can't do it. I've got no power to be able to change this. So I'm going to come to the cross where you first forgave me. I'm going to ask for the power of your resurrection to come and, and save this. And I, and I sang worship songs in the car and I gave my heart to, back to God. I gave my tongue back to God. I remember actually speaking in tongues at that point. And then a few shifts later, I remember I realised, I thought, wow, actually, I didn't, I didn't swear today. And then I thought, actually, I, didn't, I don't remember swearing for a few days. I, I was so surprised, I nearly swore. So what, what if the way we change these areas of our lives is less about trying and more about dying? Because that's the way the Bible describes how God changes us now. We give up not just the old way, but the old me. And then I live a new life in the power of the Spirit. So James says, if you want to become more patient, two things not to do. Don't grumble, don't swear, make a note of those things. Then he tells us three things to do, or rather to think about while we're doing life, while we're waiting patiently, when we're standing in lines maybe, or when times are hard or where people annoy us. What do we do in those times? Number one, remember God is patient. Make a note of that. Look again what James says. Be patient, therefore, until the Lord comes. Be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. The judge is standing at the door. James is saying we should live every day as though Jesus could walk right in the room, as though Jesus could return today and he'll judge everybody, including me. How different will we live? How patient will we be in how we judge people if we remembered that we could be judged by God today? Martin Luther famously said, I have two days on my calendar today and that day. And James seems to have been the same way when you read in his letter how many times he talks about Jesus coming back. But do we live like that? I think it might be an insight into how God sees time now too. You see, God is eternal. He's in no rush, but I rush about and I get impatient because I live by the clock. I live by the diary. I live by all the appointments on my phone and all those demands. But God looks at heaven's calendar. And right now, and every day of your life and mine, ever since Jesus came to earth for the first time to purchase salvation for us, he says, the, the, right now it is just today. And what's today? See, I look and I think, well, today is Sunday. And tomorrow is Monday. But no, God says, today is the day of salvation. What time is it? Well, it's just after 11 o'clock. God says, no, now is the time of my favour. So now is the time for us to be saved by his grace today and to get the word out to the world about his favour while there's still time. Because God is eternal and he's never in a rush. The Bible says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Since Jesus went to heaven and sat at the right hand of God in glory, it's only been a couple of days to God. But one day, time will literally run out and then it will be the day. The day the Father decides. What day? The day of the second coming of Christ. The day of judgment. The Apostle Peter wrote, it's most important, it's of first importance to understand that in the last days, he says, scoffers will come, scoffing, <laughs> saying, when's it going to happen? This day of Christ's coming has not happened yet. It's never going to happen. But one day, the Father will say it's that day. And the, the word James uses here in the Greek is parousia. It means the day of arrival. It's like the day when Christ arrives. Are we ready for the day when Christ arrives in glory to judge the living and the dead? The day when heaven opens up and the King of kings and Lord of lords appears, wearing many crowns on his head, with his eyes a blaze of fire, and every eye shall see him and every knee bow before him. And Peter says the only reason that day hasn't happened yet is because God is patient. It's still the day of salvation. He wants more time. He's giving more time for more people, more of us, to realise that and to choose heaven rather than hell. He says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God has been so patient, so patient with you and me, so loving. The everlasting God, He's given us time. He's giving us time now to get ready for eternity. So James says, don't grumble, don't swear while you wait, but remember, first of all, God is patient. And he says, remember God's like that farmer James mentions. He sowed a lot of seed in this world. And you don't just plant one day and pull it up the next. You wait 
and see. And some of the seed falls on stony ground. Some gets burnt up or choked out. But one day, God is going to reap a harvest. God isn't operating on factory time. He's operating on farmer time. And heaven operates in seasons. Did you notice he talks about those different kinds of rains? Even rainy seasons are part of making it grow. So don't swear. Don't grumble. When you're going through those hard times, remember God is patient. And number two, James says, remember the prophets were patient. Here in verse 10, he says, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. I read my Bible every day and when I do, I'm encouraged for what I go through. When I read about, when I see the stories of patient people who persevered, read through Hebrews chapter 11 for a summary. People like you, people like me, some of them get named, others are known only to God. But I read about it, it says, Noah warned about things not yet seen, built the ark when everybody thought he was crazy. Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. His wife, Sarah, considered him faithful who made the promise. And then it says, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. That's prophetic. That's actually prophetic patience in action. It's not looking back. It's not past present focus. It's being present future focused. Hebrews 11 lists all these examples of patient faith, not passive, but patient, waiting on God, trusting him. It says Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons. Joseph spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born. What a prophetic act of faith that was, putting the baby in the basket. Moses, when he grew up, left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. It's prophetic again. Then the writer says, I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised. So James says, if you want to learn patience, remember these prophets. You know, read your Bible and add in John the Baptist too, the New Testament prophets. And think about the present day suffering, persecuted church. Read about the work of open doors. Be encouraged to keep waiting on God where you are and trusting him while you wait. In a vision of heaven in Revelation chapter 6, the Apostle John sees and hears some of these prophetic martyrs. People who've faithfully proclaimed the word at the cost of this life crying out now and they're under the altar in heaven is the picture and they're crying out how long O lord how long until you judge the earth and it says and each one of them was given a white robe and told just a little longer verse 11 that's what it says they were told to wait just a little longer it might seem a while a long time to us but it's just now is the day of salvation because god is patient so don't grumble don't swear be patient during this time because God is patient and because his prophetic people see what's coming and they're patient they're waiting and longing to see what God will do and finally be patient and remember it's not over yet that's the third reason and the best example James can find of that out of the whole Bible is Job now Job if you if you, if you know the story if you don't know the story let me tell you Job had it all and lost it all he was a good man Nine children, rich, happy, until Satan's attack got personal. Thieves took away his properties, lightning struck his possessions, death took all his children, sickness took its toll on his body. His friends turned out to be hopeless, and his wife said, why not just curse God and die? And that's just the start of the story. So what did Job do? Right at the start of the story, Job 1 verse 20 says that this Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In other words, he didn't grumble. He didn't swear. Yes, he wailed as he waited, but he worshipped. And the story isn't over, you see. 
he's seeing that God's up to something. Yes, he's grieving, he's got his questions, he's confused. 40 chapters full of questions in the waiting, in that gap. And friends couldn't answer him in ways that helped. And, 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 and when God showed up, he basically said, you know, even if I gave you the answers, you wouldn't understand them. And face to face to, to, with God, he knows that that's true. At the end, he says, I spoke of things I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me to know. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. That's in the last chapter of Job. The story's nearly over then, but it's not quite over. Because it says, after Job had prayed for his friends, because like I said, they were hopeless, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. Remember, he's on farmer time, not factory time. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And so Job died an old man and full of years. What's that story telling me about patience? Remember, God is patient. Remember, the prophets were patient. And yes, Job was a prophet too. He heard and saw God, although it was through the tough times that he saw him most clearly, rather than in the good times. And so the final point, whatever we're waiting for, however long we have to wait, be patient with circumstances, be patient with people, be patient with yourself, be patient with God, because it will be better in the end. And while you wait, don't grumble, don't swear. God is patient and it will be better in the end. So if it's not better yet, that's because it's not the end.